So the title of the sermon uh, this evening is Reasons to be Family Integrated. Reasons to be Family Integrated. And, you know, of course, you know, we all understand here what family integrated is. If we don't, what that simply means is the fact that we keep all the kids with us in the service. You, you've probably noticed that uh, so far, that we don't segregate the families. We don't separate them and have the kids go off in other rooms with, and have a whole other service. And I want to kind of just go over some of the reasons why we're family integrated. Because, you know, often in Christian life, we start just to do things out of, out of, uh, out of habit. Sometimes we just start to do things because, you know, that's just the way we've been doing them for so long. And we might actually begin to forget why we're even doing what we're doing in the first place. And I think it's a good reminder. You know, if you were looking for the Christmas sermon, uh, 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 that was this morning. So, you know, if you didn't get that one in, uh, I apologize. But this is, this is what's on the table tonight. So we're going we're gonna to get into this. But uh, this is an important subject. Uh, this is something that we need to nail down. And it's something that, um, you know, I have quite a bit of experience with on both sides of, of being in a church for several years now that is family integrated and having been in a church that was not family integrated. Now, granted, when I was on the other side, when I was not, when I was in a church that was not family integrated, you know, uh, I was there very briefly when I had my first child. However, I was there and I was the guy that you would send your kids to. You know, I was, uh, this is uh, seven years of junior church and, and bus ministry talking, so I know a little bit about what it's like to run these children ministries. And um, I don't want to, I'm not, in the sermon, let me just start out by saying this, just to clarify. I'm not disparaging other churches that are not family integrated. If there's a church out there that, that uh, has the reasons to uh, have their ministries that they do and they want to do what they do, that's fine. You know, and there's plenty of great churches out there that are not family integrated that you could be a part of and, and be a blessing in and grow in. And uh, this is certainly not something that we need to, uh, you know, break fellowship over. Now, I will say, if, if those that are pro-family, uh, or, or excuse me, rather they are uh, against family integration, you know, they can go to the other extreme. You know, we don't go to that extreme to where we say, you know, you must be family integrated or else we cannot attend your church. But I have heard of cases where they say, your children will go in the nursery or you are not welcome. And that is, that is not scriptural. That is not a biblical reason to forbid somebody from fellowshipping. You know, you're not going to find that in the list of sins in 1 Corinthians 5. You know, you know drunkard, covetous, refuseth to nurse in the, you know, <laughs> in a separately in a bathroom stall. That's, it's just not there. Uh, so this is not something that should, should break fellowship for people. This is not something of that nature. But nonetheless, I believe it is a very important subject, uh, one that we need to be reminded of, of and, and quite frankly, to just be appreciative of the fact that we have a church that is family integrated. So one of the reasons why we need to be family integrated is because look there in First Corinthians or First, excuse me, Colossians chapter three and verse twenty. It says, "Well, let's begin here in verse. Uh, let's begin in verse uh, seventeen, and it says, Whatsoever ye do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him.'" Then he begins to address specific people. He's addressing specific groups within the church. Notice he says, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord. Then he goes on to husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. And verse 20, it starts out with this word, children. You know what that tells me is that he was directly addressing the children in, that, in this church. Meaning that this, was, this epistle was going to be read in, in, in Colossians and all the churches. And that the, in order for the children to hear them being addressed in this epistle, they would have been present in that service. They would have to have been there when it was being read. So we see that the Bible, you know, one of the great things about it is that it's for everybody. It, it, it has a message for everyone. Husbands, wives, and it goes on and address servants. Other chapters we see where it addresses the, those that are, are being served, you know, the masters, the employees. It addresses pastors, deacons, lame, and everybody. There's no one in the world that the Bible doesn't address, including children. So, you know, perk up kids a little bit tonight that, and understand something. If you don't get anything else tonight, that the Bible is written to you. And you might not like what it says, right? It says there, children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. You know, it's telling, hey, kids, you want to you please God in your life? Here's a great way for kids to please, or please God in their life. Obey your parents. You know, when you, when you disobey your parents, you're not just displeasing your parents, you're displeasing God. And this is kind of a side note, but, you know, hey, think about that. That's what this is saying here. I mean, beyond just the fact that the Bible is addressing children, what is it saying to the children? That they ought to obey their parents. And when they do that, that is pleasing to the Lord. 
But the point I want to make here is that it's addressing children within the church, meaning that they were there, they were present when this was being read. And what that also tells me is that children of all ages are capable to learn from the preaching. They say, well, it, it goes over their head. Well, maybe, maybe the preacher just needs to bring it down a notch. You know, or maybe, maybe he needs to quit worrying about trying to sound like some pseudo-intellectual all the time yeah, right. and quit trying to you know, you know, just pour out some you know, flowery speech full of big words and actually just speak to people like normal human beings. And the kids will actually get something out of the service. I mean, that's what this tells me, that, that children are to be there in the service so that they can learn something from it because children are capable from learning in the service. <coughs> you know, Ephesians chapter 6, we're right there. Let's just turn over to Ephesians. <coughs> Ephesians chapter 6, you know, it addresses children more than once. <coughs> Excuse me. It says in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1, Children, obey your parents. <laughs> Kids were like, maybe you'd say something else. <laughs> children, you know, go play outside. Or children, you know, enjoy a cookie after the service. No, it says children. By the way, kids, enjoy a cookie if your parents are right with it. But it says there, obey your parents. Why? In the Lord, for this is right. So again, the Bible is addressing children directly. And I think that's a great thing. And some people would say, well, yeah, I understand that kids of a certain age, I, and the kid begin to understand things. But here's the thing. I believe that, it, and even science tells us that, that, Yet even infants and toddlers, the things that they're hearing and seeing, I mean, they're, they're like little sponges and they're absorbing so much even as, as just infants and even as just toddlers. There's so many things that they're learning. Even, you know, even before they're born, you know, in utero, they, you know, there's, I believe they're, they're taking in things. They're absorbing things. Their minds are forming. You know, we think about, you know, the songs that are sung. You know, our, all my children were, were, you know, while they were in the womb, you know, were in a Baptist church. Hearing the hymns being sung, hearing, hearing the preaching, the word of God. You know, I can remember uh, I, even even as an infant, my I don't know which child it was, but they would they would hear the preacher's voice and they would kind of look, like they were it was already familiar to them, like he already knew that who that voice was because they had been there three times a week hearing this guy over and over again. You know, and there's nothing they could do about it. You know, they were kind of <laughs> it was a captive audience, right? So. <clears throat> The point being that infants and children, you know, why should we keep them in the service? Why should, we, why should we stick to our guns on being a family integrated church? Because of the fact that kids can get something out of it? Right. Because of the fact that infants and toddlers can learn something? Uh, you know, I see this all the time in my own family. My, my kids are growing up and, you know, I'll come home from work or whatever. My, or my wife will show me some video of one of the kids, you know, early on. Karen was especially, uh, did this a lot before she had siblings. You know, she, she, we have videos of her just preaching, the, like, you know, now I understand she's a woman. This was uh, not in the context of church. You know, this is in her living rooms. You know, so, you know, this, we're not, we aren't in, in sin here. But we would see her, you know, get out her Bible, and she would be, she, before she could even form words that made any sense. You know, I was like, man, we got a Pentecostal in her hand. You know? She's charismatic. I was like, she's filled with the Spirit. Praise the Lord. So, but you know, she's got up there and she's practicing preaching. I've seen, you know, Corbin John, he's sacked out now, but he would get up and he would, we'll, we'll catch him. He'll go preaching. They used to sit around, they'll sit around and play church. You know, wouldn't we want that for our kids? And I'm saying they're playing church. Like there's pews, there's a nursery, there's a pulpit, somebody's preaching, they're singing. You know, people need, are expected to sit up and be quiet and not disrupt the service. My mothers are taking the children out and spanking them. And this is crazy. It's a full-blown church service in my kids' living room. And uh, the, where did they learn that? You know, they learned that from being in church. You know, and maybe they didn't get some deep, profound meaning out of the Word of God. But you know what? They're getting used to being in church. It's, that's what they're accustomed to. And when they get older, not being in church, that's going to be very foreign to them. They're going to say, whoa, this, this is strange. They're going to want to be in church because that's what they grew up doing. So that's why it's so important to have children in the church. You know, and we, we could take the time, but we won't for, uh, for the sake of time, to turn back to Moses. And we could read about how Moses, you know, what it was, uh, you know, they put him in the, in the little uh, the, the ark of bulrushes and sent him down the Nile. And of course, we know the story, you know, Pharaoh's daughter finds him and then his sister comes along and finds a nursemaid, and, and, which turns out to be his mother. And then after he's weaned, he goes on and, and becomes Pharaoh's, uh, the, uh, the daughter of, uh, or excuse me, the son of Pharaoh's daughter. And, but what, is, what happens later in his life? 
is that he ends up, you know, you know, re choosing rather to suffer affliction with the with the children of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Now, did he learn that in Pharaoh's house? Do you think that's where he learned what it was like, what it meant to be a Hebrew? Do you think that's where he learned who the true and living God was? No, I'll tell you where he learned that, friend. He learned that on his mama's lap. He learned that from the things that he was told as, a, as an infant, the things that he learned as a toddler. Something on a subconscious level, perhaps even, made an impression on him at such a young age that when it came time for him to make a decision of who he was going to serve with his life, he chose God. And why was it? Because he had a godly influence. You know, that goes to show us not just the influence you know, that a godly mother can have on a child, but also the fact that children, very young children, can be influenced for God at a young age. That's why we want to keep them in the service. That's why we want them here, hearing the preaching of the Word of God, getting used to being in church. And, you know, and they do learn things, even small kids. My kids have repeated so many things over the years uh, that they heard in some sermon, just out of the blue. You know, they'll, they'll call me on the car carpet and say, Dad, Pastor said you shouldn't do it. No, I'm just kidding. But, you know, <laughs> but they'll repeat something they heard in some sermon. You know, and you'll say, wow, I didn't even, you know, I thought you were just over there nose mining, you know, but it turned out you were actually paying attention, you know. <coughs> if you don't know what nose mining is, you know, it's a, anyway, <coughs> let's move along. But the Bible, you know, uh, you know commands uh, us to teach our children as well. And why does the Bible command us to teach our children? Well, let's turn over to, uh, <coughs> uh, let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy chapter number 6. I know we've been in Deuteronomy at least uh, once a week uh, for several weeks now, but let's remind, we've been through this chapter. Let's go back and uh, rehearse this again because this is an important truth. You know, the Bible commands us <coughs> to teach our children the things of God. Deuteronomy chapter number 6. Let's look here in, in uh, <coughs> uh, Deuteronomy chapter 6, beginning in verse 5. The Bible reads, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy soul and with all thy, uh, and with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. And these words which I command this thee, thee this day shall be in thine heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto their children and shalt talk of them when thou sit in the sign of the house, when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. Look, God wants us to constantly just be teaching our children the things of God. Except when we go to church. Then it's somebody else's job. Then we're just going to send them off somewhere else. Oh, sure, when we got them, you know, when we're rising up and sitting down, when we're in our house, when we lay down and we get up, all this, so on and so forth, we're supposed to be doing it. But now when we get to church, let's let somebody else do it. That doesn't make any sense. God wants us to take spiritual responsibility for our children and not rely on other people to do it all for us. <coughs> you know, children learn a lot about, about church just by observing their parents in church. Observing, you know, how their parents react to church. Are they faithful to church? Are they there consistently? You know, do they get in the car and say, can you believe it? You know, they, they take all that in, right? There's a lot that they learn about church, not even necessarily what's preached across the pulpit. But they learn these things <coughs> even at a very young age. These things begin to sink in on them and make an impression and uh, will, will have dramatic effects on them <coughs> later on in life. The Bible uh, remind, reminds us of, uh, let's remind ourselves of Daniel, right? We all know the story of Daniel when, the, when him and the, the, the three Hebrew children, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Daniel, they're taken into uh, you know, the land of captivity. They're taken into Babylon. And they were just children at that time. I and mean, we don't know exactly how old, but they, the Bible you know, calls them children. They were very young, yep. right? And uh, of course, they're, they're, they're brought into uh, the king's court. You know, they're put into uh, the ward of the, of the captain of the eunuchs. And uh, he goes to feed them the king's meat. We all recall the story. And Daniel had purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the king's meat. Now, what is meant by that? It's not that Daniel had become a vegan, right? It's that he, he was not going to eat that which was sacrificed on idols because he knew who the true and living God was. Now, where did he learn that? Did he learn that from some stranger, you know, singing... Uh, uh, you know, well, how's the song go? We should, you know, those of us that are in it. Uh, <laughs> I am one of them, and so are you. you. <laughs> Who knows this one? Come on. Father Abraham. Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham, and I am one of them, and so are you. So let's all praise the Lord. And then you do. Right foot, Father Abraham, <laughs> many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham. You know, and then you go onto the left foot, and now you're doing this. You think that's where Daniel learned that? <laughs> Father Abraham had many sons. 
<laughs> Many sons had five. I told you I was in junior church. I know them all, buddy. In, right, out, right, up, right, down, right, happy all the time. You want to do it backwards, I can do that too. Out, right, up, right, down, right. I get you all confused. <laughs> so I know what I'm talking about here. But uh, hey, did, is that where Daniel perp learned a purpose in his heart that he's not going to defile himself with the king's meat? No, he learned that when somebody, a parent, a preacher, a priest, you know, at a temple, you know, or, or at the, uh, at, so, at the, at the uh, you know, in God's house sat down and opened up the word of God and said, you shall have no other gods before me. Yeah, right. You know, there is none else in heaven besides me. You know, that these, the names of these false gods will not be in your lips. He learned that from reading the Old Testament, the law, from learning from the Bible. And, you know, that's where he developed the character and the knowledge and the wherewithal to refuse the king's meat and to not defile himself. He didn't learn that in, you know, some you know, slap-happy junior church somewhere. He learned that from be, take, you know, the serious preaching of the Word of God, the teaching of the Word of God. So <laughs> we see, first of all, why, what are one of the reasons to be family integrated? Well, it's, it's to not, because we don't underestimate the children's ability to get something out of a sermon, whether it be just sitting in the service and getting used to sitting in a service or actually gleaning something from the preaching of the Word of God. You know, uh, we're not always the, you know, diving real deep here. There's some real just basic truths that need to be preached that children can take and run with. You know, children obey your parents is a great one, right? And there's a lot of other things that kids can learn just by sitting in the service and listening to the preaching of the Word of God. And, you know, why, why should we have them there? Because that's what's going to cause them to grow up and serve God with their life. That's going to be one of the core uh, uh, foundations of their Christian life is a... Is a a history of being in church from a young child. <clears throat> and quite frankly, I mean, let's, let's just consider for a moment the alternative of not having the children in the service. What would that be? Well, that would be putting them in another service called a junior church. Now, who's familiar with junior church? Okay, most everybody in the room. So what this basically is, is, you know, you take kids that are, you know, in the church that I was in, if you were 12 years and under, you were in junior church. And by the way, I had kids from, I had them from, they had, they were out of, if you were out of diapers all the way to 12 years old, anywhere from 50 to 80 kids, <laughs> you want to talk about having to be dynamic. <laughs> you want to learn how to, you know, if you weren't, if you weren't juggling sticks of fire and had lasers coming out of your eyes, you were going to get eaten alive by those kids. Like, and there were some days where it was just like, I felt like I was getting eaten alive. Because, you know, these kids are not coming from homes where they're being disciplined and taught how to behave. They're, they're saying, oh, you go do it. Because here's the thing, when you go out, and, and again, I don't mean to disparage it, but this is just the reality of it. You know, when we go out and, and we invite these kids to these, these programs, and yes, we can you know, preach the gospel to them and get them saved, and that's great. But we could do that at the door. Yeah. We could do that right then and there. We could, we could just stop what we're doing and just preach the gospel right there and not have to go through all the rigmarole. But the alternative is the junior church method. Now, you know, quite frankly, and I'm saying I'm sure there's many exceptions to this rule, but I mean, what's it turning out? Is it really that successful? Is it really turning out just th these these you know uh, these great men and women for God? It's not. It, it, it's teaching them everything completely opposite of what we want to see. You know, the generation that's going to be raised in, in, in what what we call a fun center, and that's what they are. There's a world of difference between the junior church and a service like this. You know, as, you know, maybe I'll get up and joke around and sing, Father Abraham had many sons. That's serious business over in the junior church. That's one of many wacky songs that we're going to sing. One of a lot of other games. You could teach them a lot of things. I know we can get a lot in there. But the model of it, of just the church is just about you having fun. Church is just about you being entertained. And then it, we're shocked when they grow up and they look for a church that's just going to entertain them. You know, a lot of times it's being, it's being run by a woman. You know, quite frankly, they're up there, the ones up there teaching the kids. And, it, and that's a whole other subject in and of itself. So why does it surprise us when our kids grow up and they go find a Christian fun center, they go down to Chuck E. Cheese Baptist Church where they have a woman behind the pulpit, you know, they go to the ecumenical fun center and they, and they have the, you know, the lady teaching them and they got the bright lights and it's all about fun, 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 fun. You know, and the candy's in the back. You know, there's a little coffee store back there where you can go and get your frappa, mocha, chino, latte, whatever. You know, it's got all, it's got all the trappings of a junior church. And they're saying, hey, this is what I grew up with. This is what I'm used to. Right. I'd rather see my kids grow up in a fire-breathing, you know, church where there's a man of God standing up saying, thus saith the Lord, 
and, and getting up, you know, having some, some a fire in his belly and preaching the word of God. And yeah, maybe sometimes it's not the most entertaining thing, but you know what? It's, they understand, hey, church is serious business. This isn't just some game. This isn't just some joke. This is life. This is real. So, <clears throat> you know, that's the, that's the why right there. That's one of the many reasons why we're not going to have a junior church ministry or anything of that sort. <clears throat> you know, and I will say this, though. At Faithful Word Baptist Church does have a children's ministry. And you're in it right now. <laughs> Would you wear that as it or not? This is, your, this is the children's ministry. Are we not ministering to the children tonight? Right. Yeah. So the, you know what? In a sense, we do have a children's ministry. We're sitting in it. So what's another reason why the, to, to have a family integrated church? It's not just because of the fact that children are capable of learning and that they do learn many things. You know, and it's not just because the, it, it really one of the other reasons is because of the alternatives. And one of the alternatives is, you know, the, the children's ministry, the junior churches. And, you know, we've already talked about how, you know, it's, it's giving them a taste for a different flavor of church. And it really is. But how about the fact that segregating families, and I like using that word, segregating families, because that's exactly what it is. What is the antonym of it to integrate? It is to segregate, right? So that's, that's a strong, <laughs> think about that way. You know, we're segregating families here, you know. And it's segregating families in church. What, you know what that does is it leaves your children vulnerable to predators. And it's not a pleasant topic. But this is the day and age we're living in. And I know I, I preached a sermon just a couple weeks ago about, you know, the perverts and all of that. But here's the thing. This is something that we have to address when we're talking about the subject. Is the fact that when we separate our children from their parents, we are leaving them vulnerable to the worst elements of society to come in and to violate them, quite frankly. And you say, well, I know, but it's a Baptist church because that really happened. Hey, I know of a church. I know a guy who went to a church and it's, it was a known fact that the bus driver of, the junior, of, the, of their bus ministry was a convicted pedophile. Molested his own daughter. They did the background check and they said, yeah, we just keep him away from the kids. We just let him drive the bus. That's all he does. What's the point? Oh, just do the background check. The background check doesn't work, friend, at all. Because all the background check is telling you is that some other kid, it was, it's already too late for them. Because they, there's always the first time you get caught. You know, and it's, and it's, it's an unpleasant subject, and I really don't want to get into it, but this is, this is the reality that we're dealing with. Yeah. You know, you can disagree with me about all these other things. You can say, you know what, you're wrong about the junior churches, you're wrong about the bus ministers. That's fine. I know there's a lot of good things that go on there. I know there's a people that we've seen saved out of it. I know that there's people that even in this ministry that have been saved out of bus routes, and I'm glad for that. I really am. You can disagree with me about all of that, but you cannot deny the fact that when you segregate families, you are leaving your children vulnerable to the worst people in society, predators. <coughs> and, they, and, and we see this taking place. You know, I, I refer back again to the sermon that I preached a few weeks ago about how the fact that we are seeing these, these filthy perverts creep into Baptist churches and get behind pulpits and places of, you know, into positions in churches to, to take advantage of the young, to take advantage of the youth. And it's a shame, but this is where we're at. And why is that? Because churches are soft targets. That's what these people call them. It's, that's an actual term. A church is known as a soft target. Now, what do you mean by that? Look, these, these perverts and these pedophiles... They understand the message of the Bible. Forgiveness, patience, long-suffering, mercy, grace. And they go, oh, you know, if I go in and do this, you know, they're, they're just, Christians are just such nice, trusting people. And they are. They always just, they want to be nice and polite, and we should be. And they'll move in, and they, and they take advantage of that. And they work themselves in these positions. And, and you know, and it's not enough to you say, well, you know, you know, we just have, you have multiple adults in there. And I, here's a, that doesn't matter. Beca because that, these type of things can happen that fast. Just something could just happen that fast. One, one touch. One, you know, one, just one little thing. And I mean, just scar your child. Right. You know, just get them thinking about all the wrong things in life. You know, and, and go down a dark, dark road. And uh, that's why we are just dead set against it. 
And, you know, that's why these, and, and, and just the stupidity, just, I'm sorry, but just the stupidity of saying, well, just run a background check. That's always the excuse that comes up, run a background check. That yeah. doesn't tell you anything. Right. All it tells you is they got caught. And they say, you know, it's estimated that for every one they got caught for, there's probably like, I don't know, a dozen more that didn't get caught for. That's right. You know, how long did they go before they got that? That's why I'm against these stupid background checks. You know, the only, ch you know, I said it again, I said it then, I'll say it again. The only check that needs to be taking place is an underground check, yeah. as in six feet under. That's where we need to get back to in this country. Because <coughs> you don't have to worry about what that guy is going to do. He's not going to do anything. Yeah. That's the kind of check we need with these people. But that's another, sub, another sermon. The what I'm preaching about tonight is why should we be family integrated? One, because kids can get a lot out of the service. You know, they can, you know, a lot of them, I can tell you right now, a lot of them are perking up. <laughs> they're listening. They're hearing the warning out of the word of God. They're hearing warning out of a man of God getting up and saying, hey, protect yourself. Look out for strangers. Right. You know, these people are out there. It's a, it's a cruel reality, but it's the truth. You know, I can, th I, you know, every time I start to think about this, I think about the two times I was nearly abducted as a child. <laughs> and if someone hadn't sat down and said, hey, you need to look out for this. If they say this or this is going on, you need to get away. <laughs> And I can remember clear as day, six, seven years old, whatever I was, just playing with my friend on the sidewalk in my neighborhood. Some guy pulling up and some, I could still see it was like a white Buick. And he, the door opens, the window comes down or the door open, I can't remember which it was, but him just saying, hey, I lost my puppy. You want to come help me find him? I mean, it's like out of an after school, you know, episode, you know, the, one of those things that, the, you know, the public service announcement. You know, I'm glad I heard that. Because I was like, this dude, this something, this is not, not right. And whenever it's supposed to ask you about a lost puppy, you're supposed to go the other way. And I remember just looking at my friend, and we just, and we got out of there. I mean, who knows, you know, what would have happened if I, if I were just naive, no one had warned me, and I had just gone along with that, you know. The other one is a long, drawn-out story, but if you're interested in it, I can tell you about it later. But anyway, uh, you know, point being, you know, when we start to hear about these things, you know, this is a good place for kids to learn. That warning is in church. Hey, you need to look out for these people. But if all the kids were in another room tonight where they're just, you know, hearing you know, some, some other sermon about, you know, hearing about Noah's Ark for the 12th time and about how all the animals come on there. You know, I, I recently gave away this great tie I had in junior church uh, to a brother in church, and it was, no, it was Noah's Ark. But it was like, it had the rain, and it was Noah, like a cartoony, and he's on his little boat with the giraffes coming out and everything. And I just, I just chuckled at it because it, we, always, you know, we always project that as just this cute, nice little story. You know, I'm like, man, I should stitch some bodies in there. <laughs> just like, you know, people floating. Like, let's get the real Noah's Ark, not the junior church, you know, dumbed down, censored version, you know. I mean, that's what the Bible says will happen, folks. And the Bible says it, then, you know, every word of God is pure, so Amen. might as well just preach it. But what if they were over there hearing that, not hearing this message tonight? Not being encouraged to say, hey, kids, you know, the Bible's for you. The church is for you. You're, you know, we're ministering to you. This isn't just for mom and dad. It's for you too. Hey, you need to watch out. You know, we're, the Bible says that we're living in perilous times. You need to be on your guard, you know, and not, you know, be, be wary of strangers, of people that are, are you know, trying to uh, uh, corrupt you. <clears throat> Why? Because churches are soft targets. <clears throat> And here's, here's another reason why. So what are the reasons to be in, uh, family integrated tonight? Because kill, the kids can learn. The Bible commands us to teach them. The, uh, they can have, be impressioned even at a young age. The alternatives are ineffective, or at, least, at the very least inefficient, and also dangerous, right? Here's another reason. Because having children in the church forces everyone to grow up. Think about this. If you are going to be a parent who's going to attend a, fam a, 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 a family-integrated church, you have to grow up a little bit. You have to be on your parenting game, right? Because you, that's why so many people will knock on their doors, they'll get saved, they'll invite, oh, I really want to come to church, and then they go, do you have a children's ministry? No, well, technically, yes, but I always say no. You know, we, we're family-integrated, and you can just kind of see it. Mm. You know, and what they, want, what they want to hear is, yes, we provide free babysitting. You know, that's what I used to think when I ran my bus route. It just became apparent to me that when I, you know, I'd be, I'd be picking up the same kids for years. And the only way you could get the parents to come out is if you have a, you know, 100 foot Sunday, you know, where, where we go, we're going to make, hey, come on out and we're going to make a world record, you know, ice cream Sunday after service. Oh, 
I guess I'll come out for that. You know, every once in a blue moon. Hey, we're going to have a carnival with horses and pony rides. And, you know, you'd have to just put on this huge show just to get the parents to come out. You know, it became very apparent to me that when I went to their door and said, hey, I'm from so-and-so Baptist Church. You know, we, run, we provide a bus you know, ministry. We pick up local kids in the neighborhood. We take them out. And uh, all they were hearing was bah, 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 babysitting, bah, 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 free, bah, 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 Sunday afternoon without your brat. Bah, 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 bah. And then you come home, they're, they're, all, they're, all, <laughs> they're all stoned, the whole place smells like pot. Thanks, man. It's like, what are we doing here? Let's just get the kids saved. Let's get the parents saved. Let's go get some more kids saved. Let's go get some more parents saved. Instead of just picking up the same kids over and over again. Just because mom and dad want them out of the house so they can have some peace and quiet. Now, again, I'm sure there's a lot of good things that come out of it, but this is the reality of it, at least that I experienced. Maybe, maybe I'm a little jaded up here. You know, maybe I'm a little cynical about the whole thing, but you know, that's, hey, that's what happened. <laughs> so, but having children in the church, it forces everyone to grow up. And you, you just see it. You know, when you're knocking on these people's doors and they get them saved, and hey, well, you can come on out to church. Well, do you have a children's church uh, program or you have children's ministries? No, because then they realize, oh, I'd have to actually get these brats to behave. And you could tell just from the 10, 15, 20 minutes you've been there, like, you, you're going to have a struggle, <laughs> you know? And I always try to say it. I'm always like, you know, we have lots of kids in the service, and you know, if they, if they get a lot of hand, we have places you can try to, like, put them at ease. Like, it's okay, you know, come to church, learn how to raise your kids. That's why you need to be there. I mean, you're, if your kids are, you know, Tearing the place apart, you know, the, you should probably be in church. You should get them out, you know, get them to, to sit still. But, you know, they, they, have, they, they don't want to grow up. You know, the parents don't want to grow up. They don't want to take the, do what needs to be necessary to have kids that actually can sit up straight and listen and be quiet and well-behaved in a church service. Because believe it or not, that actually takes some effort, you know. Parents are going to have to teach children to behave. You know, they're going to have to grow up. That's one of the benefits of having a family-integrated church. It puts pressure on the parents to actually parent. And it just blows my mind that people will, will, will you know, they, they'll stay out. They'll say, well, I don't, want, I'm not, I don't want to do that. But they'll send their kid off for six hours to a public school and say, well, they're expected. Let somebody else teach them to behave there. But you can't, they can't come out to a church for one hour once a week and try to get their own kids to just, just be quiet and sit still and, and listen up. And, you know, it's probably, they, they'd have a probably easier time doing it uh, than they think. But here's the, here's the thing about it. You know, when you have a family integrated church and it forces the parents to grow up along with the kids and uh, it forces them to teach the children to behave, you know, how do you do that? Well, you don't do that at church. You know, this is just a little tip. Now, I'm looking around the room tonight. I don't think there's a problem here. But, you know, if it ever is, or maybe we need to advice, give advice to somebody else. You know, and this is advice that I, I sought at one point. You know, I said, hey, how do you get your kids to sit up and, and, and behave and, and, and to, n to not, you know, run amok during a church service? And the guy told me, hey, it begins at home. He said, I don't teach them here. I train them at home. And that, that was like, oh, yeah. You know, the light came on. It was so revolutionary. And then he turned around and said, and by the way, your daughter doesn't have a problem. You should probably lighten up, <laughs> which she didn't. <coughs> but why? It was because we were already working on her at home. And then we just started, you know, inst hey, if you're having a hard time getting the kids to sit up and be quiet and sit still and listen, have, you know, uh, it's time to institute a little Bible time at home where the same expectations are put on them. Say, hey, we're going to read the Bible at home. You know, maybe dad could even preach a little, you know, ditty or whatever, you know, teach something out of the word of God and, the, and say, kids, you're expected right now for the next 15 to 20 minutes to just sit there and listen to what I say and not interrupt. And, you know, mom could do that. It doesn't have to be necessarily just dad. But you have to start doing these things at home. You know, and, 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 he, and now I know every kid acts up from time to time. You know, and everybody, every once in a while, has to take their children aside from a service and remind them of where they are and who you are and so on and so forth. But by and large, when it's a consistent problem, when, when it's, just, it's the same parent and the same child you know, every single service, I can guarantee you one thing. It's not going on at home. That's just a sign that it's not taking place at home because that's where you begin to train kids. And that's why a lot of people, they don't want the family integrated church because it puts pressure on them at home to start ruling their house well. And they say, well, we just, you know, they have all these spiritual reasons that they got their six page essay against, you know, family integrated church. But the fact is, is because it puts a lot of pressure on parents to actually be parents. 
and it forces them to grow up. It forces everyone to grow up. It, it forces parents to have to teach their children, and it teaches adults who aren't even the parents to have to learn some patience, right? And that's something that the adults around the kids have to learn too, of what it's like to just be patient and let, you know, little Johnny, Billy, Susie, or whatever, just throw their temper tantrum and let mom and dad deal with it, and and uh, and, and 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 learn some patience. And, you know, experienced parents, you know, they teach by example. That's where a lot of this is learned. You know, I know we learned a lot that way with our kids. And, and by what? By observing other parents, seeing how they were doing things and, and asking them questions and instituting things and, and figuring these things out for ourselves as well. Now, let's turn over to uh, Luke chapter 18. We haven't gone anywhere in a while, but let's go over to Luke. <coughs> You know, it forces everybody in the, uh, in the service to, to grow up when the kids are there. Not just the kids, the parents too. The parents have to be parents. Even people who don't have kids or their kids are grown or they don't have anybody in, in the uh, Luke chapter 18. If they don't have anybody, any children in the, in the service themselves, they have to learn to be patient. You know, and that can, that can be difficult to do sometimes. Uh, to, to, to focus on the preacher when he's preaching. But you know who else? It, it also forces to grow up the preacher. And this is really what it's about uh, with a lot of these guys, these preachers that will just insist that every child be removed from the service, every, and that they cannot, have, uh, they cannot hear a single peep out of anybody besides an amen here and there. They, they don't want the kids around. It's because you know, these, these preachers today, they have to preach in a vacuum. You know, and if the door closes too hard, oh, oh let me get, oh, they're, just, they're just flustered. You know, they have this, they just want this sterile, perfect conditions for their, to be able to preach. Look, if, if that's what it takes for you to preach, you're not a good preacher. You, you know, and I'm not trying to big myself up or boast anything. It's only come from an experience, but half the time my wife will come to me, not half the time, good night, I'm, I'm totally ripping on her, but, you know, every now and then, every once, every once in a blue moon, okay, my child will actually act up, right? One of the young ones. And they'll, they'll start screaming. They're teething, whatever. Kids throw fits all the time for all sorts of stupid reasons. You know, or some baby will be crying somewhere. My wife will say, oh, I was, I'm so sorry. You know, I was, in, I was over at, uh, I was visiting another church. I shouldn't out anybody, right? So I was visiting another church recently. I'm sure you can connect the dots. And there was some, uh, some family there, and their kid was just throwing, you know, just a, just a, a holy fit. I mean, they were just... And I, could, I remember that I didn't even register with me. And I remember them coming to me after the service and saying, hey, sorry about that. I was like, oh, yeah, now that you say that, I do recall that happening. And you say, oh, you know, are you trying to just brag? It's like, no, because I've done it so many times. Like, having kids, it's like, I, I'd be worried if there wasn't a kid making noise in that other room right now. You know, that would probably be more of a distraction to me than anything. And I'll say, you know what? I didn't even hear him, honey. I didn't even hear, you know, little Heather Ann over there. Screaming her head off. It didn't, I didn't. It was just like background noise. It was like the fan turning on for the air conditioning or something. That's how you have to get as a preacher, but that's not what preachers want. And preachers need to learn to grow up in these churches and, 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 and learn how to just preach a message with a little kid making some noise. You can't have a train of thought because that? Oh, I totally lost my place. What was I even talking about? Give me a break. Like, how pathetic is that? <coughs> you know, you should be able to uh, preach even in its distraction. And here's a tip for anyone that's you know desiring to preach: is write your sermons with some distraction. That's one thing I learned. I, s I'll s I was like, you know what? I'm gonna sit down at the kitchen table in the middle of the day when the kids are just running back and forth and playing all kinds of games, and I'm gonna try to write this sermon while I'm distracted. And so when I preach it, if it gets someone's being a distraction, it's like, hey, this reminds me when I wrote this sermon. You know, so we should train ourselves in these as in areas as preachers and as people in the pew. You know, if, if every time someone has to get up and go take the kid in the other room, you just, what is, what is he talking about? You know, you need to work on your focus. You need to work on your attention span and grow up. Having a kids in the service forces everybody to grow up from the pew, uh, from the pew to the pulpit, you know, every age group. <coughs> so, and, and you know, and, and you know, I'm going to go off on it a little bit because it's, it's frustrating. This is really kind of, this, uh, this is the muse here for this, this sermon is that just recently, I, you know, I, I met a guy who would come to visit a church that I was, you know, I was visiting. It was in Houston, okay? So I was in Houston, right? And uh, this guy, this visitor had come out and he said it was his first time there, you know, on a Sunday. 
and he had his wife and his and I think he had two kids, you know, just little kids. And he said he had been pa- listening to Pastor Anderson for a long time, and he lived several. I mean, he lived like I think like over an hour away, and he made the trek, and he's so happy to be there. And I said, well, what finally brought you out? He said, well, the church, the Baptist church I was going to, they were just fighting us on the nursery, saying my kid had to go in the nursery. And admittedly, his kid, you know, was one of the, some kids have more spunk than others, folks. I mean, it's just, that's just, you know, they do. Some of them are just sweet, serene little angels, and some of them are not. And we'll just look at that, right? And he had one that wasn't, you know, it was just, but it was still, it wasn't a big deal. It wasn't like he was, you know, tearing the, you know, hymnals apart or something like that. But it was just being a typical noisy little kid during a service. And apparently at this church where this, this guy was going, the pastor it just, just couldn't handle it. And he was just so taken aback by this that he from the pulpit said, you got to take that kid out of here. He said, yeah, you need to go to the nursery now. From the pulpit in the middle of a sermon. Now, I'm not against a, a preacher stopping the sermon to have to deal with something, but that's not worth dealing. You know, and I mean, if a kid, now I will say this, if a kid is just totally being disruptive and you know and the parent is refusing to take the child out of you know out of the service yeah there's a time and place but i i have a hard time believing that this was that kid you know and we provide these mother baby rooms for a reason so that if they they do get a little loud you can go in there you know and and sometimes that does need to take place but i i seriously doubt that was the case that you know because they had been fighting this guy you know he'd walk in the door the nursery's over here no that's okay just week in and week out, hey, there's the nursery, you need to go in the nursery, to where this pastor just, he just couldn't take it anymore. Get him out of here, you know, and call the guy out from the pulpit, you know, by name. So I could see that was the straw that broke the camel's back for that guy, and I was like, well, you know, I would never quit a church over that, but if you have an alternative, that's probably a good reason to take, a, you know, take the opportunity to get another good church that's not going to do that. <coughs> How about this? How about, you know, how about here's another reason why to have a family integrated church. You ever could think about the fact that maybe children's ministries might actually scare off responsible parents? There might be some parents that actually say, hey, you know what, we are living in perilous times. Yeah. And they might say, they're, you know, like this guy I'm talking about, they don't want their kid taken away from them to put, be put with some stranger because they actually want to do their, their duty and protect their child. Yeah, right. And so now we have, well, we're going to have this children's ministry. We've got to have... You know, all, all we got to minister to all these little kids and separate them from the parents. And some parent who actually cares and loves and wants their child protected and doesn't trust people, total strangers to just leave them in a room with another stranger for an hour, is going to say, well, you know what, I'm just not going to go to church then. You know, if you're going to insist that I have to go and, and drop off my kid in some other room behind some wall where I don't even know what's going on, you know, then maybe I'm just not going to come to church. Now, here's what I would do. You know, I thought about this. What if I, and, and praise the Lord, I'm not in this position, and, and in all likelihood, Lord willing, never will be again. But what if I was in that position? I'll tell you what I'd do. I'd fight them. I'd fight them over the issue. I'd fight them to the point where they had to, to, to publicly kick me out of that church over that issue. And then I could stand up and say, I'll leave, but you're not even biblical for kicking me out. Yeah, right. I'd say, make me, make me leave over this. You know, I would. I would. I'd say, make me leave then, you know, over this. And I'd say, show me in the Bible where I can't have my kid in the service. You can't find it. Show me in the Bible where you, where you have the authority to kick me out of a local church because I won't put my kid in nursery. They can't do it. I, and that's what I would do. That's my advice to people in that boat. Or if, you know, if there's a church an hour or so down the road or whatever, maybe it's going to cost you a little more gas money, but you know what? You're not going to have to wake up in the morning and go, here we go again every Sunday. Let's go fight the pastor. Let's go fight all, you know, little miss so-and-so that's going to meet us at the door and insist that she, you know, take our baby out of our arms or whatever it is. I mean, it's that, that's just a fight I'd rather not have if possible. <coughs> so what's the point of the sermon? Why do I, why am I, you know, I, f- I feel like everybody here has got a grasp of this family integrated concept. I mean, from the looks of things. You know, I don't see any kids wondering why they're in here. Everybody seems to know why, what we're about here, right? Why preach this? Why get up? Well, again, just to remind us of what we have here. You know, to remind us that, you know, we should not <coughs> take this church's policy for granted. Amen. That this is something that is a huge blessing to ha- be in a church. It's because it's rare. And it's especially rare. And if we would, let's turn over to 1 Timothy chapter 3 before we close here. It's especially rare 
in independent fundamental Baptist churches. I mean, independent fundamental Baptist churches, they thrive on children's ministries. I mean, I've seen them where they, I've been part of churches where they out, the children that come in on the bus routes far outnumber the attendance of, of the regular people, the drive-ins. I mean, just, far, just blows them out of the water. They're like, we had 90 people in church this morning. You know, and then the bus route shuts down for the evening service, and we had 12 people here tonight. You know, or, and I've seen just, I mean, there's ministries that are just all about the Sunday school. You know, and, and you know, I was thinking about this, just the, it's like they even, but even the people that are promote this and are just, you know, involved in it, uh, they even know <laughs> That it's not the best model because I've been in, I've seen uh, you know these church these uh, these colleges these Baptist colleges you know uh, the Bible College where they you know where they just have all these free workers where they can run these bus routes they're they're called you know the college students that's what you get when you go to a Bible college you, not only do you get an education but you also get to go out and serve in the bus ministry and all that and you know what it's great it's, and there's a lot of great experiences that come out of it but even they know. That you that there it's not the ideal model because of the fact that what they'll do is they'll bring in. I remember seeing a ministry that they they ran buses in Gary, Indiana, and if you don't know anything about Gary, Indiana, it was the cap murder capital of the year for years back in I think the the late nineties, early two thousands. I mean it was it was bad. It was a really rough area, and they would run these buses and they'd bring all these these ghetto kids in. But you know what they did? They took all their church kids and they had a completely different church program for the church kids than the bus route kids and I had no idea about this I'm like what and they're like well you know you don't want to mix the bad apples with the good ones it's like they like it's not they're segregating them from the family and then they're segregating them amongst themselves and it's like I don't know maybe 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 this isn't the best model oh you know it certainly isn't the most efficient but if we're there in first Timothy chapter 3 first Timothy chapter 3 uh, let's let's go ahead and read verses 14 and 15 so the point, the, before I get into this, but let me just say again, the application here tonight is, one, don't take this church policy for granted. Because there's a lot of people out there with a lot of stories about how they just every Sunday is just a battle to not have to put their kid in some ministry, just to get their kid, and, and there's no problem with their children. They, they're perfectly well behaved. But uh, the other application here is, you know, be a good example of a non-segregated family. I love using that word, segregated. It just puts it puts it in the right light, doesn't it? Because that's what they're doing. They're segregating. Yep. Be a good example of that. Let's because we have this policy, because we're privileged enough to be in a church that has a uh, uh, you know a family integrated policy. Let's be a good example of that and not a bad one. Let's not give the naysayers a uh, uh, you know let's uh, a reason to say this is why it doesn't work, and point at our kids and, and our and our churches and say look at this is what you get oh you want to know why we're not family integrated because of what we see at faithful word now i don't think this is the case but let's keep that up and there's just a few points that i want to go over that are going to help us maintain a good reputation as a family integrated church it says here in first timothy chapter 3 uh, beginning in verse 14 it says these things write unto thee shortly uh write i unto thee hoping to come unto thee shortly excuse me verse 15 but if i tarry long that thou mayest know that uh, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. Look, Paul's telling Timothy there is a way to behave in church, and this is something that we all have to practice, especially those of us that have children. You know, and we're pretty good about it here. You know, again, if the if the babies or the the toddlers are acting up in a service, you know, take them aside. You know, there is the nursery. You know, this is one that I think we've got down. You know, uh, if, if it's getting way out of hand in there, and I, and I don't know that it ever has, and there might even come to the point where we need to go outside, you know, and, and calm the child down, right? And, and uh, <coughs> so on and so forth. So take the, na uh, the noisy babies aside. We don't want them to be, you know, just screaming in some visitor's ear, you know, and, 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 and them saying, well, that family integrated bus business, that's for the birds, you know. We want to be a good example. Here's another one that we probably could work on a little bit. Keep kids in the seats during the service. You know, this is a great opportunity to train children to hold it, right? 
that you know unless it's an emergency you know you're you're going to be fine you know the, the, there is an emergency bathroom right there now that bathroom let me just say this i meant to m mention this in the announcements that bathroom is reserved for ladies and small children only men and boys are to take the key and go down outside and use that okay now the parents you you decide when your child's old enough to go use that bathroom you know i'm not going to say you know if you don't feel comfortable with that there it is okay <coughs> but here's the thing during the service you know they they'll they can make it <laughs> you know unless it's an absolute emergency they don't because here's the thing what you'll begin to notice is it's the same kids at about the same time yeah. about the time i start talking <laughs> It's about the time that it's like, oh, I'm not going to make it. It's like, you're going to make it. This is just your ritual. This is your little, you know, your Sunday morning ritual, your Thursday night. Uh, you know, this is how you do church. Right. You know, you go to church and I use the bathroom, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so keep the kids in the seat during the service. What about, what about, you know, not just using the bathroom, but how about this? Getting a drink of water. You know, I've had one sip of water, and I'm the one up, doing, up here doing all the talking. If anybody's thirsty in this room, it's me, right? I mean, I don't know if you can see it. I, sometimes I worry about it, but I have, like, dry white saliva that I can see coming out. And I go, man, I wonder how much is on this pulpit that's not mine. <laughs> you know? We should probably wipe this thing down every once in a while. But how about, okay, bathroom breaks, you know, unless it's an emergency, they can wait, folks. Water breaks, you know, because believe it or not, it is a distraction. You know, it's not to me. I'm fine with it. Like, it doesn't, it really doesn't, I mean, sometimes I, I go, oh, it's kind of annoying, but it doesn't bother me. It's not going to be like, oh, where was I? Oh, you know, so-and-so, I just don't know what to say now. I'm totally flabbergasted. But, you know, one, one of the reasons, one of the advantages of having turned the chairs this way is that I don't see all the other heads turning when someone else gets up to go use the bathroom. And that was going on when we had the chair that way and everyone could see that door. And the kids are over there trying to scramble for the little wood peg to go to the bathroom. <laughs> There's like four adults going, you know, it's just like, they're like, start placing bets. I say, he's going to get, no, and it's like, whoa, what's going on here? You know, or they get up to get water and it's, and, and they're struggling. It was a distraction for some people, you know, now <coughs> maybe that says more about me than them. Like you're finding that more, uh, that grabs your attention more than what I'm saying. Maybe I need to work on that too, but Hey, it helps having the chairs face this way. But you know what helps more is keeping the kids in the seat and not allowing that to be a potential distraction. Here's another one, and I think we're doing a good job on this, but let's keep it up, and, and if not, you know, we need to work on it. Keeping an eye on the kids in the parking lot. I'm, I love seeing the football games out there. I love seeing the kids with the hula hoops running around and all that. I think it's great. It'd be really great if we could find out who owned that sand lot over there. We could, you know, come in here, and, and Brother Hunter could, uh, you know, level that out for us and put down some AstroTurf, and we get the uprights, you know, and the gridiron on it, you know. That way you football fans could get your, your Sunday fix in, right? <laughs> but uh, I, 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 I'm all for it, you know. Let's make sure we're not knocking out any windows with the football. I think we've been pretty good there, right? I say I haven't heard anything. But uh, let's keep an eye on them when they're out there. You know, this isn't the worst part of town, but it isn't the best either. And I've seen some people walking around out here that I don't want around my kids. Yep. They just look a little on the rough side. So if they're out there, you know, parents... Don't just assume that they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. You know, kids, it's great that you're right out here. There's no reason for you to be wandering or off around some corner over here where we can't see you. There's no reason. There's nothing going on over there that you can't do right out here. Okay, so let's keep the kids right there. We can see them. Put the shades back up after service, you know, and we can see what's going on out there. Here's another tip that's going to help us, you know, be a good representation of a family integrated church. And I already talked about this, so I won't spend long on it. Discipline at home, and I don't think anybody in this room has a problem with this. You know, is if but if you're not doing it, that's where it has to start. You know, if you're if you're struggling in this area, you know, then you need to check on what's going on at home because that's where it begins. And as I mentioned earlier, practice at home. You know, if you're struggling, it's time to start practicing at home. <coughs> you know, so having a family integrated church, you know, it's 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 a privilege, and not only that, but it's also essential. You know, it really is important for us to have a family integrated church for, for two reasons. One, for spiritual growth. It helps everybody in the room grow. You know, from, from uh, the parents are learning to grow as parents. The children especially, I mean, they're, they're absorbing everything. You know, they're getting pre the things out of the word of God. They're growing. So it's, it's essential for that. It's also essential for another thing, safety. Yeah. For safety. 
You know, we need to have this. This is something, especially in this day and age. And, you know, it's, so it's essential for growth and safety, but here's what it isn't. It is not an excuse for poor behavior. It's not. It's not an excuse for poor behavior. But rather, it's a call for exemplary behavior. You know, having a family-integrated church, that is a reason to have exemplary behavior. Not to say, well, you know, they don't have a children's ministry, so I'll do the best I can. You know, no, it's a call for you to step up your game and let's be a model of the family integrated uh, model. You know, let's be, let's, let's, be the, let's be the poster children for a family integrated church. You know, and I don't want to get carried away with it because I, I was kind of looking into it about reading and read, read a couple articles on it. And, 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 and some people, you know, there's too much of a good thing. Some people, they, they get on this family. And it's like, I had no idea, but it's like a whole other para ministry. It's like a sub denomination amongst Protestants, this family integrated church. That's an actual, like, you look up that acronym, you know, the, the family integrated church society or something like that. Like, it's a group that's out there, you know, and they're just all about being family integrated this. And they'll leave churches, they'll cause division in churches. I'm not saying let's go there. You know, let's not start, you know, badgering other people that don't have this policy. But let's, you know, let's lead by example. You know, let's be grateful for what we have in a family integrated church, but let's also show people why you should be family integrated. I think I've given us some good reasons tonight. Let's go ahead and pray.